Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning in Asia and good evening in the US. So we're so privileged today to have a very good friend, a world renowned expert in nerve ultrasound and MSK ultrasound from Ohio. He's a full professor and he has authored a lot of books and has written a lot of uh, scientific journals on MSK ultrasound. And it is pr my privilege to introduce to you our speaker today. Uh, I learned a lot from him. He is the mentor of the mentors in Neuro <laughs> MSK ultrasound. That's you, Dr. Jim. That. Dr. Jeffrey Istrakowski from uh, Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. So before we begin, let's just uh, bow our heads for a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, beautiful evening. We thank you all, oh God, for giving us another life, another uh, way that we can give honor and glory to your name for your grace and your goodness and your faithfulness to each one of us for preserving our lives, for giving us good health and strength. We would like, Lord, to pray for Dr. Jeff as he delivers his lecture today and we pray also for the rest of our frontliners medical frontliners wherever they are that that will guide them and keep them safe from any virus so that we can continue Lord, to work uh, to help patients wherever we are thank you oh god for your grace and thank you for forgiving our sins in jesus name we pray amen so today we would like to welcome again you no know, the the person the author the professor a very good friend dr jeffrey strakowski So Dr. Thanks, Jeff. Dr. Jim. Appreciate it. And what Dr. Jim has asked me to speak on is um, high frequency ultrasound for lower limb neuropathies and also wanted me to sort of introduce um, ultra high frequency and that's looking at um, extremely high frequencies for detail and um, we'll, we'll talk about that value. So it's going to be a lot of, a lot of pictures on, in this, this talk. So yeah, we'll get moving forward. So my learning objectives for this are to kind of review the sonographic anatomy of lower limb peripheral nerves and methods for assessing normal and abnormal nerves of the lower limbs and, and go over a few clinical scenarios which ultrasound helps more than just electrodiagnosis alone. And also um, some of the value, I didn't write that in, but um, what ultra high frequency and increasing the frequency and resolution can do for us, okay? And this is beautiful Columbus, Ohio here. It's where I like to paddleboard and kayak. Okay, and Dr. Jim mentioned I have a couple of um, textbooks that um, I've done and don't get very much money for. So anyway, so when we're faced with a focal neuropathy, I thought I'd throw this out. What are some of the goals of that? And the goals are really we want to identify the abnormality when it's present. We want to make sure we localize the lesion to the extent possible. We want to qualify the relative severity. And we want to identify the cause in the of the neuropathy and potentially treatable factors. And, and of these things, electrophysiology is pretty good for a couple of them, the localization within reason, um, qualifying the relative severity, it's pretty good for that. Um, not always good for identifying the cause of the neuropathy and treatable factors. So ultrasound really um, makes a big difference in terms of being able to assess a lesion. I'm going to show you some examples of that too. So we're not going to just talk about scanning, but what we see in abnormal problems. But when we have a neuropathy of any kind, there's three things that can happen. Um, the axons can slow, so there can be nerve conduction slowing that we can detect on ultrasound, that, or excuse me, on electrophysiology. It has very little to do with clinical symptoms, either sensory changes or motor changes. And we have plenty of examples where there can be extreme slowing if there's not conduction blocked. There's really not a lot of symptoms with that. It just gives us an idea that something's wrong. So, so that's one value of electrophysiology, but it has little value to do with um, how severe someone is. Axons can block, and that's when you start to get symptoms. And this is the single biggest reason electrophysiology has an advantage over any imaging or anything else. It can distinguish a, a neuropraxic lesion from what happens when axons die, an axonotmesis. So it's, it's got great value for that. 
okay? But these are complementary technologies. Electrophysiology is by definition a physiologic assessment. Ultrasound is more of an anatomic assessment. So they work together really well. Okay, so I thought I'd mention some quick principles for nerves in general when we're scanning with ultrasound. So a lot of these seem very simple, but sometimes the, these um, basic guidelines aren't followed and then it gets you into trouble. So number one, we wanna make sure we correctly identify what we're looking at as nerve tissue. We wanna use good technique to optimize our image. We wanna know the surrounding anatomy so we know the impact of the surrounding anatomy and, and what to expect. We wanna use consistent measurement techniques. We always wanna see things in both short and long axis and we should always follow the course of the nerve so we see the entire um, direction of everything that can impact on that nerve, okay? And, and so what are we looking at when we look at a nerve with ultrasound? Well, um, here's some examples. By conventional ultrasound, what we're seeing are the fascicles that are inside the outer and inner epineurium. So what makes the dark honeycomb that we see on ultrasound and short axis are these combination of fascicles that are, or combination of fibers that are surrounded by the perineurium. So this is a level that we see by conventional ultrasound. Okay, and you know, there's quite a bit more things there that we could potentially image as our resolution improves. And we start to see um, a lot of the internal vascularity when we go up on the frequency and go up on the resolution and that can help us identify abnormalities. Okay, so this is ultra high um, resolution that Dr. Jim wanted me to mention certainly in this talk. This is an example of the median nerve compared to the um, flexor carpi radialis tendon. This is the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve and we can see these fascial planes in great detail. We can also see um, each individual fascicle of the nerve and that allows us to actually follow different elements. So if there's partial nerve injuries, we can have an anticipation of what components of that nerve will be affected. Okay, and this is at a 70 megahertz um, is definition there. This is the tibial nerve here, since we're gonna talk more about lower limbs. So this is the medial and lateral plantar nerves after they've separated. This is the posterior tibial artery. We can see the muscular walls here. And as they start to move, that resolution increases a lot. We can see any kind of effect from the flexor retinaculum, the overlying subcutaneous tissue, the underlying flexor hallucis longus tendon and short axis. Okay, so we'd see a lot of that in great detail. And you can really see it better when it moves, okay? So that's the value of ultra high frequency is that degree of resolution. So for focal neuropathies, it's helpful in the context of compression tumors, post-surgical alteration, trauma, can give us some information about severity, can provide more precise localization than electrodiagnosis, and I hope to convince you of that if you're not certain already, and can be helpful for peripheral nerve blocks. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that in this talk, but we'll mention a, a few, few um, examples. So what are things we inspect when we're looking at nerves for abnormality? So we wanna look at the caliper. And when you're looking at the caliper, you're looking for abrupt changes in swelling or notching, and you wanna utilize cross-sectional area and diameter of the nerves. You look at the contour and inspect for irregularity. We look internally at the fascicles that I just showed you. So you wanna inspect for non-uniformity and large nerve atrophy or disruption. This is really critical for nerves that are more severely injured. And we're finding that um, it's not simply a matter of is the nerve enlarged or not? What is the internal components of the nerve? Because a lot of the more severe injuries are affected internally, even without enlargement. And we have plenty of examples of that. You wanna absolutely identify whether it's in continuity or not. Are there extrinsic or intrinsic factors like tumor, intrinsic tumors or intrinsic ganglion that could be affecting the nerve? Is there an influence on the vascularity? Is there increased mobility, or there abnormal mobility either increased or decreased, and that includes both the nerve itself. Is there normal nerve glide, or is there unusual tissue movement around the nerve? Those are things we always wanna look at. And what's the effect of the surrounding tissue also? Is there fibrosis, compression, scarring? This should be a checklist of things you're considering when there's been some injury. A lot of that's based on your history and physical. So just a, a cartoon view of the internal components of the nerve. These are some of the changes that we see with conventional um, ultrasound. You start to see a loss of the normal fascicular structure. Now what, what we tend to see in um, higher resolution is it almost looks more grainy and we just see a loss of the detail. And the higher the resolution, it looks a little less like that and more like a, um, a, a significant change. So I lost, a, okay, I got, this, got these two slides backwards.
we can look for nerve trauma and look for neuroma si uh, area of an enlargement. So this is um, a, a cartoon view of what a neuroma could look like. You see the swirling and loss of fascicles here. Um, and this is what we see, you know, with ultra high frequency. This is 48 megahertz. We can see the normal fascicles here moving into this um, abnormal neuroma that looks very similar to the detail of that, okay? And, and, you, and we can tell that the outer structure is still in continuity, but this is a very severe injury because we've got complete loss of that fascicular architecture as it moves across that from that space to that space. Where, where we can, and we can localize it down again to millimeters. You look at the, the, the uh, scale here, okay, that's, that's an, um, 11 millimeters, the, the entire um, screen. So we're seeing little components of that and we can really detail this. This is very helpful if we're gonna go do um, procedure either with needle guidance or with surgery. So I'm gonna get into now lower limb neuropathies. We'll start with the hip and we'll just kind of work our way down. And so in general, Nerves around the hip are more challenging to see, okay, most especially if you live in Columbus, Ohio, because our, our BMI, our body mass index is a little higher than um, some other places. And so it gets um, more challenging to localize. And oftentimes, nerves around the lower limb in general, in most things, aren't necessarily common entrapment sites. So they can be related to other issues. And they're often less understood than our upper limb entrapments, which we have more detail and more convention in terms of sizes. So with that in mind, when you approach a neuropathy about the hip, you wanna make sure you use a very disciplined clinical assessment and use electrophysiology um, when that can be helpful. Remember to scan more distally too, because if you're up at the hip level, you wanna see the effect more distally, both the nerve and, and maybe the muscle that innervates. You should use frequent side-to-side -side comparisons, and that is helpful, most especially if you're looking at a nerve that you're not as familiar with. And perform a detailed inspection of the surrounding tissue. Okay, that's also critical. All right. And this is an example of the femoral nerve. I don't know, with, with everybody's faces here, I can't tell if I actually finished my whole slide deck. There we go. Yeah, I did. Okay, so this is an example of the femoral nerve and looking at this, and so this, it's a little challenging to see, but we can use the anatomic landmarks and that helps us. So we can find the bony acoustic landmark of the femoral head. You can see the articular cartilage, the psoas tendon, iliacus around it. And we know that the um, femoral nerve sits just next to the femoral artery. The femoral vein in this case is collapsed. Here's the adductor muscles here. Okay, so we can look at that in short axis we can use Doppler to identify the vascular structures and also see if there's neovascularization. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd talk about, so after we've identified that level, we're going to actually start with lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. It's technically incorrect to call it lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh because it's not a branch of the femoral nerve. It's instead got its own branch directly off the plexus. Okay. And we know that it clinically innervates sensation to some, some semblance of this portion of the thigh. Now, curiously, most people with a cutaneous nerve like this, you'll find that their abnormality clinically is usually less than the entire innervation of that nerve. And that's because there's cross innervation from some of the other sensory nerves. So the sensory deficit's usually smaller than what you'd expect for the um, entire innervation. Here's a nice way to do a nerve conduction for this. We can do um, use the bar electrodes, use the ground between our stimulus and our cording. We like to stimulate with a needle and, and we can get a, a nice sensory nerve action potential when it's healthy. <coughs> okay, and this is the um, position to scan for the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. We find the bony landmark of the anterior superior iliac spine. And a lot of times it's, it's helpful to go just distal to that. Here's the nerve itself right at the anterior superior it may go above or below or even through the inguinal ligament, so you have to be aware of that. And there's an example of that right there where it's basically um, just below the inguinal ligament. I'll show a few examples here. This is a slightly enlarged one here compared to a normal size. And now going to ultra high frequency, we can see more detail. We can, so this whole outline here is the nerve itself. This is the inguinal ligament, so we can actually look for thickening changes of the inguinal ligament, most especially if there's been trauma. 
you can see a little bit of the bony landmark of the anterior superior leg spine here. Okay, and, and more distally is oftentimes a place where you can see it more easily. So if you're having trouble finding it by, by the anterior superior leg spine, a nice way to do this is actually scan a little more distal and short axis, you'll find the, the fascial plane between the sartorius muscle and the tensor fascia lata, which is lateral, um, it leaves this little compartment and you can usually see that dis nerve very distinct at that level and then you can scan backwards to the area of the inguinal ligament. This is an ultra high frequency of 48 megahertz of the same nerve and this whole area is that nerve at a higher frequency and this is right up against the inguinal ligament. Okay, and there's um, classic enlargement. So when they're abnormal like this, they're very, they're much more conspicuous, much easier to see. Okay. And there's other things, for example, here's an enlargement of the nerve right around a bony spur. And I've, I've actually seen a number of cases where the, I think this is the basis for this neuropathy. So um, a spur or calcaneus or, a, or a osteophytic spur can develop from the origin of the sartorius. And sometimes that nerve just that moves right across the spur. Here it's the nerve is, you can see the little fascicles there. And, and this is causing a spur. This is a, a cook who often leaned up against the table and he was getting symptoms from that. Here's another longitudinal view. So this is the nerve here in longitudinal from cranial towards the left, caudal towards the right. The nerve is focally enlarged right there at the level of the spur and long axis, okay? And that's con just conventional ultrasound. And it's always good to do side to side comparison. So in the area where we think it's enlarged, we can compare it to the normal area too if you're not used to looking at that, okay? Now here's an example of the importance of always getting two views. So we can scan back and forth and see the abnormality and we can see how focally it's abnormal at this level in longitudinal. So it's pretty enlarged where it comes down and then starts to um, move distally into the thigh. Here's an example. So we can do measurements too. We can do diameter measurements. Um, and compare them. So look at, you know, how extreme that is, most especially when you're trying to um, demonstrate this to a referring doctor. And you can, this is ultra high frequency. So this is a significantly enlarged one. It's almost, it's over three and a half millimeters squared here. And, and just like other nerves, you just do the inner border or the outer epineurium and um, you can identify the enlargement. I mentioned, this is back to the case with the spur. There's a spur there. I'm going to move it back and forth and you can see this nerve just being compressed right over the spur. Wish I had a little longer video. So th this is actually the, the source of the, we, in this particular patient, I was convinced this is the source of the neuropathy, is that just a little irregularity in the bone. It's only because the nerve is right up against the anterior superior like spine at that level. Okay, and I think this is more of the same. It's coming from a little further distance and you can see how that spur, um, affects that. So it's nice to look at the anatomy, not just the size of the nerves. That's one of the critical things. And sometimes you can get some explanation. So uh, this is also a, a nerve that responds fairly well to different types of injections, whether um, you're using localized steroid or hydrodissections. And, and again, seen in both short and long axis. Here's an approach for the injection. I usually come, I, I always do every nerve injection I do, I always do in plane. In this case, I'm going from lateral to medial, and I'm gonna just do some injectate around that. And this is the case, here's the nerve here. I create a nice halo next to the nerve itself, and that adds conspicuity, and then allows you to move around the nerve uh, safely with making sure you're not doing an interneural injection, most especially true when the, when the nerve divides. So this is the obturator nerve. We thought, we'd, I thought I'd move to that. And there's the basic innervation, and there's both an anterior branch and a posterior branch that we can identify in the thigh. This is a nerve that again is very hard to follow its whole course. And, and so we, we can find it in certain areas. And here's anatomy, but you know, there's a cutaneous distribution of the obturator nerve. So clinically we look for that. We're gonna look for adduction weakness. These are the muscles that are innervated by the obturator nerve. We see the anterior division between the adductor longus and the adductor brevis. The posterior division of the obturator nerve is between the brevis and the um, adductor magnus. And we'll show that here. This is a way to scan, and it's usually easiest to identify in short axis. Here's the sensory distribution that should, I probably should have drawn a little bit more proximally on the thigh there. So 
One thing to remember too is that this is not really a sagittal plane or coronal plane or even specific transverse plane to the thigh because the adductor muscles actually kind of move obliquely, yet the nerve goes directly down. So we want to really follow in short axis to the nerve rather than the direction of the muscles because they do cross. This is just creating the adductor longus brevis and magnus in a split view. So it allows us to see both sides. If we have an enlargement of the nerve on either side, the anterior posterior branch, it might be more conspicuous when you've created a view like that. And here's an example of the anterior branch. We see the fascicles in its vessels between the adductor longus and the adductor brevis and the posterior branch, which is a little, usually a little more um, caudal in position and also between the brevis and the magnus. So we can um, identify that. It's, it's rare that you're gonna see a, an enlargement unless there's a penetrating trauma or some other kind of rupture. But here's a, an example of turning the transducer and I've, I've developed a uh, long axis view of the posterior branch of the obturator nerve by doing that. So if there was a focal enlargement, this view would help us identify that. That's a challenging view to get. But we can look for things like a, a massive adductor tear, for example, or other kinds of trauma and looking at the tissue around where the nerve is, that can help us identify specifically what may be the cause of something we, we've already identified either on a clinical or electrophysiologic basis. And just some more examples of, this is an abnormal adductor tear that actually had some resultant neuropathy of the anterior branch of the obturator nerve, and that's the normal side by contrast. Okay, so femoral nerve, I started to introduce that. And femoral nerve, just like the obturator, is challenging to follow because it it comes across the inguinal ligament it's it's a nice round uh, honeycomb appearance at that level then it, it branches into multiple branches uh, vir virtually within a couple of centimeters of passing the inguinal ligament but you can follow each individual pathway and you can learn all that anatomy and it's um it's it's very doable when you have specific injuries cutaneous innervation remember follows basically the anterior femoral cutaneous branch and the um, saphenous branch. And there should be a little bit more under the knee for the infrapatellar branch. So it's okay to call this the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve branch because it's, this is a branch of the femoral nerve. Okay, so remember when you know doing a, a clinical exam, we wanna identify if we think there's a femoral nerve injury, is there a difference between weakness of hip flexion and knee extension? For example, a lower or inguinal ligament level injury to the femoral nerve will have some mild hip flexion because the um, rectus femoris will be affected a little bit, but not the iliacus or psoas, okay? And, but the extension could be very weak. So, and, and I have shown my residents sometimes at bedside, I've had residents that have been convinced that their femoral nerve was working and they were getting the extension when instead in a, in a line position, all they were doing was extending their hip with their gluteal muscles and it made it look like they're extending the knee. So they thought it was weak, but some function, you wanna make sure that you isolate that clinically, okay? And then we can do, here's a good way to do a nerve conduction for any of the vastus muscles. And we like to use a needle stimulation at the femoral nerve to, to get the ideal compound muscle action potential. Here's the position of the transducer for starting the femoral nerve. And remember, it's nerve, artery, and vein, with the vein being the most medial. And so that's the nerve there. And the iliacus and psoas is just lateral to that. Here's another view. We can find the femoral head. There's the psoas tendon, psoas muscle, iliacus, and the femoral nerve sits basically on top of the tip of the iliacus and the psoas right against the femoral artery and vein. Now the femoral artery and vein have their own sheath. So this has a separate sheath that branches quickly. And I'm not gonna get into all the anatomy of that, but um, just know that it branches off to the sartorius pretty quickly after the inguinal ligament and then branches from there. This we can see in long axis too. So there's a long axis view of the femoral nerve, and this is a nice perspective if there's a focal injury, like from a catheterization or um, some other kind of trauma in that region, we can contrast it to it's sitting over that tip of the iliacus muscle. There's a psoas tendon even further deep to that. Okay, and I mentioned the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh that branches quickly into the intermediate cutaneous nerve. 
and the meiocutaneous nerve of the thigh. And it gives us some of um, the sensation there. And we can identify those fascicles as well. If they're injured focally, we can follow the branch to the vastus lateralis, which moves deep to the rectus femoris. So we can see these and the uh, recurrent femoral artery moves with that. So it's very conspicuous. We can also see a branch to the vastus medialis. Okay, and we can follow each individual branch. So if there's a, a large muscle tear or laceration, we can identify the source of some of these. And sometimes we'll actually try to uh, re-anastomose these nerves if they've been lacerated by surgery or trauma. We can always look for enlargement and doing a side-to-side -side comparison is, is helpful too if you're not familiar with these and do a, a similar uh, assessment on both sides. Look at the difference between this diffusely enlarged femoral nerve from a stretch injury and a hip dislocation compared to the normal femoral nerve on the opposite side. So this is grossly enlarged all the way through its, to the point that it, uh, it starts to branch. Okay, and remember that nerves like this that are complicated, have complicated courses, we can gain a lot of information simply by looking at muscle architecture. For example, this is the denervated rectus femoris on the affected side compared to the same level on the unaffected side. So doing contrast side to side is helpful. Okay. And here's some more examples. Also following distally, we can follow the saphenous nerve. And that's a large, the largest sensory branch in the human body. It, follows, it goes underneath the sartorius next to the femoral, art, femoral profundus artery. So it often emerges next to the vastus medialis. Okay, so it's sartorius there. Another example. And around this artery, there's also, you're going to see other fascicles too. There's other branches of both the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve that run on that side. And many of these fibers innervate the knee and give pain sensations to the knee capsule. So this is going to be on the, the more medial side of that artery. And you'll see it as you um, scan distally, start to exit towards the knee. And here's the sensory distribution for the saphenous. And there's the infratellar branch also. And there's the scanning position for the saphenous here. Now, these are, this is a very challenging nerve to see. It's helpful to identify the, the large or greater saphenous vein. And it usually lies between that vein and the edge of the tibia along this line here. Um, and it's finding the vein first is usually the helpful way to do it. Now, if you can cheat and use ultra high frequency ultrasound, it's very helpful. So here's the great saphenous vein. And you can actually see the reflection of some of the red blood cells in that vein at this level of um, resolution. Okay, and here's a long axis view of that vein. Here's the long axis view of the saphenous nerve. And you can see it's great contrast. So we can even see, and this is the shorter axis view. So it really helps for these superficial small structures to, to enhance the resolution to the extent that you're, you're able. And I mentioned the infraspatellar branch, sometimes that is injured, both trauma, knee injuries, knee replacements, other kinds of surgeries. We can see that if we follow it um, carefully, we can see it by conventional ultrasound here. This is the area of the pes serene. And you see the gracilis tendon, semitendinosus tendon. Here's the deep part of the medial collateral ligament. And this is the edge of the tibia. And there's the sartorius that usually rides somewhere between the sartorius and the gracilis tendons superficially. Okay, again, we're going to pull out our ultra high frequency transducer and we can see every little fascicle of the infratellar branch. So this is very helpful to identify in, a, in an injury pattern. And most especially if we're going to intervene um, and, and assess its response. Sciatic nerve, can okay, you guys know the innervation for that? The only fibular innervated portion in the thigh is to the short head. Everything else is a tibia, is a tibial nerve innervated for the rest of the hamstring muscles. And it's, it's interesting, we call this the sciatic nerve, but it's really just two nerves that ride together. There's no interaction or crossing of, of them to any extent and, until they actually give off branches to the sural. So um, they're, they're just basically, it's a compilation of two nerves that run together next to each other and then bifurcate in the, uh, in the apex of the popliteal fossa. But it can get injured at that level. So we know the sciatic nerve comes in most people from deep to the piriformis, but it can actually go through that area. We can see the inferior gluteal nerve and artery right next to it. The posterior cutaneous nerve, the thigh also exits near that area, okay?
And again, that one's not called the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve because it's not a branch of the femoral nerve. Superior gluteal nerve comes out superior to the piriformis out of that same area. Here's an example um, of the sciatic nerve deep to the gluteus maximus near the ischial tuberosity. There's a long axis view of the sciatic nerve at that level and short axis view again. And these are different components we can see when it exits out of the piriformis. So we can look for this artery here and that's the inferior gluteal artery and the inferior gluteal nerve is, is right next to it. And there's the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. And, and we can follow those back and forth and back and forth scanning to see its direction will help us. We'll see the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh fascicles become superficial. To, we'll see the inferior gluteal nerve actually move into the um, gluteus maximus muscle and we can see it in the inner muscular substance of it. And here what I did is um, just drew an outline of what portion of that is actually a sciatic nerve, what portion of this is the other components in that area. And we can see all that at that level. Okay, and here's blown up view of the same thing, sciatic nerve. We can find the inferior gluteal artery. The nerve is right next to it. And, and another structure that's easy, more conspicuous identify is a short axis view of the semimembranosus tendon over the issue of tuberosity. The sciatic nerve is just uh, lateral and deep to that. And this is gluteus maximus muscle over the top. Okay, and so the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh I mentioned, we can see, and that rides up in the fascial plane usually over the biceps femoris. There's a sciatic nerve has gone deep to that position. This is with ultra high frequency, and this is 48 megahertz, and we can see the, the individual fascicles of the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, and we can follow it with that higher resolution. And scanning back and forth, it allows to see that nerve. Okay, as I continue down with the transducer then, we'll see these tendon remnants of these muscles. It's the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris long head create the conjoint tendon, which lies in between and superior to the sciatic nerve. Okay, and we have to be careful we don't confuse some of these tendon remnants with nerve tissue. Okay, and here you'll notice if you look carefully, there's both a fibular and tibial component that are completely separate of the sciatic nerve. So they really are just two nerves that live right next to each other. There's part of the conjoint tendon and there's the adductor magnus deep. Okay, and I only, I put this in here because you have to be aware of, you know, superficial veins and things like that can cause some change in your um, transmission deep to that. So it's usually helpful to collapse them down rather than leave them open. And more of the same. So there's the conjoint tendon again. And um, this is the adductor magnus, long axis view of the sciatic nerve. And this is actually a I think it looks like a tadpole. It looks a little bit like a nerve, but following back and forth, you'll identify that that is the tendon of the semimembranosus. This is the conjoint tendon again. So scanning proximally and distally, you can see that the tendons virtually disappear, whereas the uh, components of the nerve maintain itself. And just moving back and forth a little bit, I'm gonna have to move this out of my way. Okay, so just we're just seeing a little bit of move, movement there. And there's the semimembranosus tendon, sciatic nerve, conjoint tendon. And again, going from very proximal, this is the semimembranosus tendon, sciatic nerve, and I'm scanning from a cranial to a caudal position. So see that semitendinosus um, moves this way. And, and so knowing that, you know, again, here's another picture of the same thing. Just a really important to be able to identify these structures, semimembranosus tendon, sciatic nerve, conjoint tendon. And so we don't want to confuse those with the nerve structure. And, and there's long axis view as well. So when we're long axis to any structure with ultrasound, we remember there's only about a credit card width of beam. And so we, before we move forward in long axis, we've got to scan back and forth, make sure we've seen the width and then we can move um, down, the, down the track and see that. You have to be a little careful if you're slightly oblique rather than along the length of the sciatic nerve. It could look like it, you have a focal enlargement or, or an abnormality. And there's also vascularity that crosses over. So you have to, it's good to look at things in both views to get a full understanding of it. As we go more distally then, we're moving down towards the apex of the popliteal fossa and it starts to separate into the fibular and tibial nerves.
There's another example, and you can see again the fibular and tibial components, even way up in the mid thigh, are, are very distinct from each other. And they're actually kind of slightly oriented differently. I just throw this one in here to show how much it moves around just with a little bit of contraction. So if you're lost on nerves that you're not used to scanning, remember they usually sit in fascial planes, otherwise they get kind of torn apart in the mid thigh. So seen between these fascial planes of the hamstring muscles and adductor magnus, that's a um, nice place to identify it. So just like the femoral nerve, we want to look at the surrounding anatomy and look for nerve enlargement. Here's the abnormal. Why this is also another stretch injury. So we see the abnormal side on the right, the normal cross-sectional area on the left, and there's quite a bit of difference between the two. That's cross-sectional area, 50 and 86. And this is the, they're flipped here. So the abnormal one now is on the left and long axis. And you can see diffusely we have a loss of architecture, whereas we have a normal one in the same person on the opposite side. Okay, and remember, just like femoral nerve, well, these big nerves that are challenging to see sometimes always look at the muscle architecture. So this is the denervated soleus gastrocnemius um, compared to the normal side. And, and one thing to pay, you can help localize nerve injuries like that because you can identify and and for example, does the, uh, do the hamstring, semitendinosus, biceps femoris, do they look normal? If they look normal, then that gives us a good sense that the denervation occurred distal to the level of those, um, those nerve branches. And that helps us a little bit, most especially if it's really abnormal in the calf. So we'll move down to the knee. And neuropathies about the knee can be confused with injuries at other locations. And for example, the hip. So you could, you know, certainly all of you that have experience in this have seen um, sciatic nerve injuries where the femoral components affected, for example, after a hip replacement or a stretch or a traumatic injury, where it looks just like a pure fibular nerve injury. And um, instead it's actually, it's at the sciatic level or in the thigh level. So you have to be careful with some of these. A lot of these are often related to external or internal compression or trauma around the knee, and it's generally less understood than upper limb entrapments, just like the hip. And you, again, should use disciplined clinical assessment and electrophysiology when you need to. Remember to scan more proximally when you need to. Use frequent side-to-side -side comparisons. So the common fibular nerve, it's, again, we're down at the apex of the popliteal fossa. We can see the biceps femoris to this side, we can see the fibular nerve. Note that the fibular nerve is about one half to one third the size of the tibial nerve in most people at that level. So if there's an abnormal fibular nerve, if it's as big or bigger than the tibial nerve, that should give you a clue that it's, it's abnormally enlarged. And the short axis view is a little easier to see the structures. Here lies the common fibular nerve between the gastrocnemius and biceps femoris. And here's a long axis view that's sometimes a little harder to identify. Okay, and just more pictures of the same. And these are some of the other structures, the lateral femoral condyle, lateral gastrocnemius, and biceps femoral short head. Paying attention to these muscle architectures too are helpful when you're concerned about denervation. Okay, there's the nerve at the fibular head by conventional ultrasound, and an enlarged one at the fibular head. And so we want to make sure if we see a focal enlargement, we can identify it in both short and long axis. And this is at the fibular tunnel. So the fibular tunnel goes through the two portions of the fibularis longus, right? So there's a static picture of that. And there's the nerve, a little hard to see, but once we move it back and forth, here we got a video. Going back and forth, it adds conspicuity. So when we start moving it, so we can see it moving across that layer. And it actually usually is already bifurcated into its deep and superficial branches as well as its articular branch at that level by the time it hits that area. This is the articular branch that we can see that goes to um, the um, tibial fibular joint. And we'll talk about that it has significance as well in some cases. So here's ultra high frequency. Dr. Jim wanted me to point out some ultra high frequency images of all of these areas. This is in the popliteal space. We can see the detail of the tibial nerve. We can see the smaller fibular nerve here and look for focal abnormalities. Okay, now this is a common fibular nerve getting close to the fibular head. So you can see the extreme detail here with ultra high frequency. And what I can tell you is it's already beginning to bifurcate 
or even trifurcate into the fascicles of the deep fibular nerve, which generally go first into the fibular tunnel and they're trailed by the superficial fibular nerve, but this is all within one epineurium. It gets a little bit challenging when they start to separate and there's connective tissue in between them. Um, when you, you put all your eggs in one basket of cross-sectional area because you can be a little oblique to the fascicles and you may not be accounting for how much it's separated, which has individual variability. Now these set of fascicles over here are the lateral serocutaneous nerve. So that's the fibular contribution to the sural nerve, which tends to come off just before the fibular nerve goes into the fibular tunnel. And it's usually very conspicuous. Okay, so another example, this is in short axis at the fibular head, just before it's moved into the fibular tunnel. The leading branches of fascicles are the deep fibular branch, the trailing branch or the superficial branch. And that's true for most people. Here's an example of an intraneuroganglion cyst. I mentioned the articular branch, but we can get ganglion cysts that come from rents in the um, tibial fibular joint and in, in, into that articular branch and it moves up into the fibular nerve and causes a neuropathy. This is one reason to always scan a nerve at this level if you don't have a great reason why they have a neuropathy there. This is the common fibular nerve on the good side by contrast. Okay. So getting into branches, the deep fibular nerve and superficial, we'll talk about deep first. I mentioned that the deep fascicles tend to lead into the common fibular or into the fibular tunnel and and they tend to go quickly deep into the anterior compartment. I'm doing the wrong one. That's the deep into the anterior compartment. And this is the superficial branch into the lateral compartment. And that's the articular branch that goes and innervates the lateral portion of the tibial fibular joint. Okay. The deep fibular nerve has very little sensory representation and most patients are unaware if they have an isolated deep fibular neuropathy, most of the time they'll say their sensation is normal. It's not until you do a detailed exam that they kind of recognize, oh, yeah, I guess I am a little numb right here in this first web space. So most of the time the sensory complaints are there if the superficial fibers are also affected. Okay, and there's the anatomy of that. The blue is the superficial fibular, light blue is the deep. And you guys know that anatomy. So more examples of that. Here's the position for the transducer. I like to have people usually on their side when I'm scanning this area down into the leg because I can get the common fibular nerve posteriorly and then move laterally here. So this is the deep fibular nerve. It can be identified um, at this level. So here's the fibularis brevis and longus sits superior to that. The extensor digitorum is here. The tibialis anterior is here. The superficial fibular nerve exits subcutaneously from the lateral compartment here between the extensor digitorum and superficialis brevis. The deep um, fibular nerve sits on top of the anterior tibial artery. We saw an interesting case today where somebody was having pain um, from a muscle herniation where the extensor hallucis longus was protruding up through the, between the tibialis anterior and extensor digitorum. And there was concern it was causing some problem with the nerve. And uh, um, I didn't get those slides on here. That was pretty neat to look at. And it gets much more conspicuous as we move down towards the ankle. So here's some conventional. It's very helpful to find the Doppler flow of the anterior tibial artery. And we know that the deep fibular nerve in the anterior compartment is right next to it or on top of it. Okay, here's some more. And there's some more. So that's conventional 15 megahertz ultrasound. And there's the deep fibular nerve again, extensor dig. It, you notice that if there's some denervation involved, there's less conspicuity, it gets even harder to see. This is, there's obviously some hardware in this case that's led to some problems, okay? And in neuropathy, this is, we can see the mechanical scar that's led and there's hardware and the deep fibular nerve has got some enlargement here, okay? Now, as we start getting, um, higher and higher resolution, we can see these details in more significantly. Okay, so here's an example of the superficial fibular nerve on top. There's a deep fibular nerve down by the ankle. We're actually into the foot level. So this is extensor digitorum brevis and extensor digitorum longus tendons that go over the brevis. So we can look at a number of things here. We, this is a place where we get arthroscopic port injuries. It can happen to either one of these. We can look for denervation in the lateral branch to the extensor digitorum brevis. 
and the medial branch is what goes and innervates the sensation. Here's the what is now at this level the dorsalis pedis artery. Okay, and, and here's a partial injury to a deep fibular nerve using conventional ultrasound. Okay, it's a little hard to see, but we can identify it. And there, see that focal enlargement there, right? There, it gets large, it's right next to the artery. Okay, and that fit clinically or the right where they were having symptoms. Now, if we go to ultra high frequency, which Dr. Jim wanted me to do, that's the same case. And this is with us uh, 48 megahertz. There's the artery, and we can see this big neuroma here, the deep fibular nerve near the scar level. Okay, here's a dynamic view of that. So we'll watch it go back and forth. And you see how it gets focally enlarged right there. Now we can up the ante even further. And we can see that nerve in longitudinal view, and it goes from this caliper and this caliper to this caliper. So we can see real precisely where the, the injury is. And here's a dynamic of that. And this is also can be very important in terms of um, some of the therapeutic interventions we do with, with needles. And so I can even do real specific diameter um, assessments here and just portions of a millimeter resolution. So superficial fibular, I mentioned this already. Here's conventional ultrasound. We can find that those fascicles. In most people, it exits the lateral compartment about eight to 12 centimeters proximal to the tip of the lateral malleolus. And there's some individual variation. The more distal it, it, it exits, the more likely they are to get injured with a, a inversion sprain injury, for example. So we can see it in longitudinal view here. There's a nice view of it between the, these two muscle layers here. Extensor digitorum longus, fibularis brevis. And then we can see it exit the lateral compartment and head on its way and then it's gonna bifurcate into the medial and intermediate dorsocutaneous nerves. And there's that with a little higher frequency. So we can see the intermediate dorsal cutaneous that's going to innervate more of the lateral part of the dorsum of the foot and the medial dorsal cutaneous that'll innervate more of the medial part of the dorsum of the foot. Okay, and more of that. There we can you see how well we can really see it when we start moving to, and there's a bifurcation into those two branches. I'll show it again in case it went by fast. This is after it's already subcutaneous. But again, for small injuries, as we increase the resolution level, that helps us. Okay, here's a quick uh, case. I'm not going to go through differential diagnosis since I'm not able to actually uh, communicate with anybody here via Zoom. So um, you guys could all be asleep and I wouldn't know it right now. I don't even know anybody's out there. But this is somebody with a BKA and was having stump pain. And this is showing an example of how well ultrasound can be used to find this is a stump neuroma. And we can follow the superficial fibular nerve to the area and know exactly which nerve is being affected. So that can help us with treatment and decisions. There's a short axis view of that neuroma. And, and again, here's a dynamic look of that. Okay, going back and forth. So we were able to um, treat this specifically and, and help him wear, start wearing a prosthesis. That's exactly where the pain was. And that was the superficial part. So it wasn't actually in the scar, it just happened to be an enlarged neuroma there. So here's a case report for injections. This is a 42 year old woman sent for an ultrasound evaluation for persistent pain, was diagnosed with RSD or complex regional pain syndrome after an ankle contusion six months prior, been refractory to treatment. She had been on high dose opioids and um, multiple other medications and re was really miserable. Clinically sensitive over superficial fibular nerve distribution, and the, an ED, we did an EDX and showed um, not an absent but a very low superficial fibular snap amplitude, and so it was an incomplete nerve injury. So we used ultrasound, and here it is. This is the neuroma in the superficial fibular nerve. This is in the long axis. So um, one thing that I would caution you if you're looking at these kind of things in long axis, remember I said you need to go back and forth and see both the medial and lateral portions because you could potentially miss it if you don't. So as we go back and forth here, the neuroma becomes more obvious. So you wanna make sure you scan back and forth on it. And when I, so we did a hydro dissection and long story short, had just great results with this and she got off her opioids and was extremely happy. I just show, thought I'd show a couple images of that. So here's the, here's the neuroma, the superficial fibular nerve. 
we always do in plane with our needle and usually do short axis, but sometimes I'll rotate and see what I'm doing in both short and long axis. I like to go, when a nerve is very superficial like this and caught in scar, what I like to do is go by the nerve first, add a little bit of um, injectate that adds conspicuity to the borders of the nerve, then it can come backwards and make sure I'm not actually causing nerve trauma with that, most especially if they're really stuck in scar and it's hard to distinguish. So that's the first thing I'll do. And then, then I'll move out on both sides of it and try to open up space and try to alleviate that with the scar, with the hydro dissection. Here's just a couple of short videos of that same thing. I, I was just getting used to doing the videos and I made them too short here, but so go past it first, work our way back with the needle so we're not injecting the nerve itself. Then come backwards, open up space below first, and then it'll come out above it and peel off scar on top. That's just a classic hydro dissection there. Dr. Jim, I know a lot of people in your neck of the woods are doing a lot of these already. They had great results. And there's a nice opening. She was very, very happy after a couple of injections like that. There's a little halo afterwards of a saphenous nerve injection. So I thought I'd talk more about tibial nerve. You guys know this anatomy here. Most of the time, there's not a lot of pathology in the mid leg, but syndromes, other things that we have to pay attention to. And this is again anatomy that you guys already know. Just over that. This is our position for the transducer. Again, remember the tibial nerve is generally bigger at the popliteal fossa than the fibular nerve, and we can follow it down and we can see the branches to the gastrocnemius, soleus plantaris, um, popliteus, um, and all, all those muscles around the level of the knee. It's hard to see sometimes, but we can find the posterior tibial artery and identify that. If we can see the artery, then we can see it adds conspicuity to this. This is particularly hard to see in a denervated state, which is oftentimes what, when we're looking for it at that level. So you wanna make sure that um, you can identify the vessel. Here's an example of one that's um, not very normal also, and it's, this is a schwannoma of the tibial nerve in the, at the calf level. So th abnormal things do happen in that level. It's, this is a long axis view here. Um, so we wanna be able to identify it when we need to. Another look at the anatomy. Okay, and tarsal tunnel, people like to talk about that a lot. Um, it's, a, it's an area that we're asked to investigate frequently. I, what I will tell you is this is not a common entrapment site. It's not anything like carpal tunnel syndrome, but it can be a source of nerve pain, and it can be an entrapment for various reasons. But I would recommend always imaging this if you do feel that you have an entrapment there because there's virtually always something you can identify as a source of it. It just doesn't behave like carpal tunnel syndrome. And there's some variations where the medial and lateral plantar branches come off. There's the, the first branch of the lateral um, plantar, plantar nerve is the um, inferior calcaneal nerve or Baxter's nerve, some people call it. And there's also the medial calcaneal nerve. For those of you that do procedures or anesthetic blocks, you wanna make sure that you've identified the medial calcaneal nerve because if you're doing an anesthetic block, there's extreme variation where this branch is off. And if you don't anesthetize this, they're gonna be miserable if you're doing uh, something down here like the plantar fascia. Okay, here's the cross-sectional area, tibialis posterior tendon, flexor digitorum tendon, the ar artery and veins, tibial nerve and flexor hallucis longus. This is the ridge of the medial malleolus. Okay, and there's the plantar branches, the medial lateral plantar branches. You can follow those down. Again, the same anatomy here. And I mentioned the calcaneal branch. So this is, a, in most people, exits off before it enters the tarsal tunnel or really close to it. And it's very small and it's hard to see. What, what I tell people is doing back and forth scanning can make it a lot, much more conspicuous. I thought I had a, I don't have a video of that, but you want to scan back and forth and you see it coming and going back and forth to the nerve. Usually you'll see uh, its own little artery will branch off and follow with it. Okay, and this is the inferior calcaneal nerve that comes off the lateral plantar branch. Very hard to see with conventional ultrasound. Once you start learning the anatomy, it, it gets a little easier. As we start, start going up with higher resolution, <clears throat> we can see this area in more detail. It's the flexor digitorum longus, tibial nerve here. We can see the arterial branches flexor halysis, and we can start getting a perspective of the flexor retinaculum, how thick it is, is there scarring from trauma, things like that. 
Now this is ultra high frequency and look at the detail we can see with the tibial nerve here. Look at the detail we can see of the flexor retinaculum. Okay, so the, the higher the frequency within reason, the better. But this is, this is an area where we wanna use multiple frequencies to identify it because we're gonna see different things at different levels of frequency. Okay, you may not penetrate well enough with just ultra high frequency, so it's good to use a combination of different frequencies. And I try, I'm trying very hard to get people away from this idea that we can just do a cross-sectional area of this nerve and then, then we, you know, it's above a certain level, it's abnormal, it's below that level, it's normal. We have to be very care careful about that because there's lots of variation and there's also the different in terms of the way they separate, things like that. So here is using ultra high frequency, we can see the fascicles of the medial plantar branch, the lateral plantar branch, the inferior calcaneal nerve here. And this is connective tissue. So what's the problem with that? Well, what, what area do we do a cross-sectional area? Do we just do the medial and lateral plantar branches? If we, we don't have this level of resolution, it's very hard to identify which part of that is the inferior calcaneal nerve. This is I, ideally where we're doing the level of the fascicles. So we have to be, the, the more distal in the tunnel that we go, the more these fascicles will separate and the larger our cross-sectional area is gonna be. So, so be very careful just using simple cross-sectional areas and absolute values because there's a lot of variation. Here's the inferior calcaneal nerve with ultra high frequency. So this is the lateral plantar branch and this, these fascicles here are Baxter's nerve or the inferior calcaneal branch. And if you don't believe me by that appearance, then we can look at a dynamic. So here's the Baxter's nerve. There's the um, flexor retinaculum as I move back and forth. So we can see them back and forth. Now it's gonna join what I call the mothership of the lateral plantar branch in a minute. Goes through there, boom. There, and we can see those two uh, set of fascicles. Now it's gonna come back away again. And there's two groups of fascicles. One's an anterior branch and one's a posterior branch of the inferior calcaneal nerve. The anterior branch is the conventional one that is motor branch, the abductor digiti minimi. The posterior branch innervates part of the calcaneus. And we'll see that one more time going back and forth. So there actually is a sensory component to the inferior calcaneal nerve that, um, and, and that's where some of the pain fibers come from it. So it can affect the heel. And there's an example of, this is very high frequency and that's uh, the posterior branch is heading towards the calcaneus, anterior branch that's gonna go um, deep under the heel, or the calcaneus. This is also helpful for looking at surrounding structures. So this is the detail of the tibialis posterior tendon with ultra high frequency. This is the flexor digitorum tendon. So more subtle abnormalities in some of these tissues can help us with higher frequencies. Same thing with vascular structures here. This is the posterior tibial artery. We can see the muscular walls. We can see some reflection from the red blood cells. And then we can use Doppler on there too to see flow colors better for the higher flow states. Okay. And none of us are doing a lot of flying right now, but our day will come. So here's just a quick case of Remember I mentioned if there is truly a neuropathy, make sure that you've scanned it and looked for the basis of it. Here's just an example of a, a posterior tibial vein thrombosis that compressed the tibial nerve and caused compression. There's the thrombosis and the nerve and long axis. And here, here you see that this vein is not compressible like the others and it just caused enough mass effect that it caused some problems with the tibial nerve. Um, this one here, I, I mentioned pay attention to fascicular size. This is one that is, there's, that's just the fascicles are abnormal. This is a pretty normal sized tibial nerve and one that has um, post-operative changes. And this is, this is a gentleman who was having foot and ankle pain for many years and a surgeon decided, well, he needed a tarsal tunnel release and he actually injured the medial plantar branch. So if you did electrophysiology in this case, you would think, well, it's, it's the, the injury is further down in the foot because it only affected the medial plantar branch, but instead the surgical injury only affected the medial branch, even though they were right next to each other. So that, that would have fooled us in terms of the localization, but here's the entire nerve. Okay, this is by contrast, look at the smallness of these fascicles. So this is a little disturbing. It's something that subtle and conventional ultrasound um, this is the abnormality, but this, this is one that was basically non-functional because of 
that degree of change. You can see it a little better in long axis. So this is the medial plantar branch on the good side. And you can see the fascicular architecture. There's the abnormality with the scarring um, uh, and just a small area in long axis on the other side without a lot of enlargement. Okay, sural nerve. I mentioned there's a lateral serocutaneous and medial serocutaneous in most people, but there's variations in these branching patterns. Then it comes down and makes the lateral dorsal cutaneous nerve uh, um, as well as the uh, lateral calcaneal branch here. Okay, and this is kind of a way to look at that. And it usually sits between the fascial plane of the gastrocnemius and soleus. And there's a sural at the popliteal fossa. And it comes subcutaneous out of the posterior compartment. And we also see the sural down close to the um, lateral ankle. So um, we can find it there. And, and a nice place to identify that is look for the lesser saphenous vein or small saphenous vein. Okay, and it has both the lateral branch and the medial branch, which join in the mid calf. And we can see that in much better detail with ultra high frequency. So here's the medial cutaneous sural nerve and the small saphenous vein up in the calf level at the medial gastrocnemius, lateral gastrocnemius. So that same area with ultra high frequency ultrasound. This is the lateral cutaneous nerve that's up at the fibular head. It comes up. This is where they come back together again in the lower left. Okay. This is an example of a normal sural nerve and an abnormal sural nerve that somebody just had an isolated sural neuropathy. And so the electrophysiology just showed an absent sural and it fit clinically. Um, what people weren't aware of is there was a ganglion cyst that was causing the compression. So, so the electrophysiology demonstrated the problem, but it didn't demonstrate why the problem was there. And that was the value of the ultrasound. Okay. And that's a long axis view of the sural and the, the ganglion cyst around it. So down to heel pain, you got calcaneal pain, bursitis, plantar fasciitis, a number of things can cause it. Plantar fasciosis, we, we like that term better because it's really not an inflammatory problem. Um, that is frequently the issue, although most of my foot surgeons don't think so. But, but we, we have to pay attention to if, if we can identify an abnormal um, inferior calcaneal nerve. Okay, and then Morton neuroma and it's not really a true neuroma. And, and it should say Morton because Morton didn't actually have the neuroma, but it can be a very painful um, enlargement of connective tissue around the nerve. And it's usually at the confluence of the medial lateral plantar branch. So most of them are in the third web space, but not all of them. This is the sensory distribution you would have if it were, were a true neuropathy. Most of them, as you know, don't have that, however. Most of them don't have true sensory loss. And that's because it's not a true neuroma. It's a um, set an enlargement. Okay. And the clinical examination of those are often unreliable. So the advantage of ultrasound is we can see a lot of other musculoskeletal issues that could also cause those problems. Everything from maybe stress fractures you'll see in ultrasound if you see a cortical break, synovitis, adventitial bursitis, intermetatarsal bursitis, ganglion cysts, osteoarthritis, and even plantar plate disruption. So those are all things that we scan for. Um, we generally, I, I generally like to scan both with the transducer dorsally and on the plantar side. Remember that the, a true Morton neuroma will be below the intermetatarsal, the lower intermetatarsal ligament. So this is actually scanning from the plantar side and there's a Morton neuroma there, just underneath the inter, um, metatarsal ligament. There's another one there. And the, the critical thing is the abnormality and the hypocoic signal intensity should not be compressible. If it's compressible, then it tends to be more considered a bursitis. I'm gonna ask Dr. Jim, we're, we're past 10 o'clock now, and I kind of took you through the survey of the, the nerves. I've got a lot of case examples, but maybe we could save that for another day. What do you think, Dr. Jim? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jeff. Uh, it was a very uh, thorough, I was awed by all the examples and the details of your lecture. It was just amazing to see all these uh, small nerves uh, come alive in a very uh, nice uh, ultra high frequency ultrasound. I'll do uh, one, I'll do a couple of summary slides here. How about that? Okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So summarize for scanning peripheral nerves with ultrasound, always optimize your image, scan sufficiently, see the entire picture, always scan in more than one view, 
use muscle architecture, always have a comprehensive differential diagnosis, including surrounding musculoskeletal structures. Remember what seems impossible today will one day be your warm up, guaranteed. And I thought I'd show, this is a, I didn't have my glasses and it looked like a beautiful moon, I thought. And you know how the moon is like really orange when it's on the horizon? You can see it through the trees. So I went to get my glasses and oops, not quite what I first thought. So, but here's a, here's actually a beautiful sunset in Columbus, Ohio. All right, now I'm done, Dr. Jim. I like Thank, you. Thank you for your attention. I like Thanks, everybody. <laughs> that was really fun. Well, I'm, I'm always uh, awed by your lecture. It's really so much uh, detail. And as I've said, uh, what can I say? It's uh, just a beautiful lecture about nerves. And I've, I've never seen any lecture like that in the past. So thank exactly. you very much, Dr. Jeff. And really appreciate all your efforts. Uh, I just wanted to find out if there are any questions from our attendees tonight, this morning. Uh, please uh, uh, open up your mouth and, <laughs> and say something about oh okay there's a question here okay okay this is from azmi dr azmi would you like to uh, oh he's asking about genicular nerve visualization uh maybe uh uh dr azmi can ask that directly dr azmi would you like to ask that question he's actually from iraq right you're from iraq so dr azmi nice. would you like to ask the questions directly he may be, he is asking about genicular nerve visualization and I think uh, he may be referring to the infrapatellar saphenous nerve that you have discussed. Uh, maybe with similar names. Okay. Hello. Good morning, Dr. Jim. Good, good, yeah, good evening yeah. for us. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. Good morning for me, <laughs> uh, Dr. Jim. Uh, Dr. Jim. Yeah, I'm asking about uh, genicular nerve blocks. Uh, can we visualize uh, the genicular nerve blocks at uh, when we do, uh, especially in uh, management of the of the osteoarthritis of the knee? That that's I would say that's you know what the definition of a good question is is one that we have an answer to, and that's one. I don't really have a great answer to, but it's one that's bothering us as well. So it actually, it's a very good question. Um, the, the, the problem with the geniculate nerves is there are so many of them that we're having a hard time trying to decide what's important and what's not important. And so we can, we're, we're actually working on protocols to see the geniculate nerves in more detail. And, and by convention, I, I'm sure you're already aware of this, most of the time we use fluoroscopy because we go for bony landmarks. Now we found, and, and I'm working with, uh, I, I have a sports medicine doctor that I'm working with that's very interested in that and, and trying to get ultrasound protocols, but we haven't been that successful yet, and, and, but we're working on it right now. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has sort of uh, slowed us down a little bit in terms of getting um, numbers of people to scan, but we're trying to use the ultra high frequency transducers to, to be able to see some of them. And then um, we're gonna, from there, go back to more conventional ultrasound. And, and, and one, one thing Dr. Jim always mentioned to me is like, well, not everybody has those ultra high frequencies. What I found is once we learn that complicated anatomy, then you can start to go back and see it with the, the lower frequencies as well. But the genicular nerves are just a very complex set of structures. Some come from the fibular nerve, some come from the obturator nerve, some come from the femoral nerve, some come from the tibial, and so it's very complicated. I'm curious, have you had much luck looking at it with ultrasound? Yeah. I are, do you use ultrasound guidance to do your genicular blocks? Yeah, yeah, yes, doctor. Yeah, okay. I do it. We should write that up. <laughs> so, but we, but we, we, we do that too to some extent, but it's, 
it's um, we're, we're trying to come up with a, a protocol to reliably visualize those consistently, and I don't feel like that's been done yet. Okay, there's there's another question here from uh, Mike. Mike, would you like to speak to Dr. Jeff? Hello, Mike. Dr. Mike. Hello, are you still there, Mike? The question of uh, Mike is, uh, okay, let me just read it. Has there been instances when there are signs of atrophy and ultrasound, but not detected in EMG? Yes, good question. So, if you see signs of atrophy, there's different things that can happen. And and this is important around shoulders, but important really if we're doing peripheral nerve evaluations too. So you can get fatty infiltration in muscles just from disuse atrophy. And, and or for example, if you have tendon tears, tendon ruptures and rotator cuff or other things, and even in the lower limbs. And if the EMG is normal in that circumstance that, and there's significant atrophy or, or change, then that usually tells you it's more disuse as opposed to neurogenic atrophy. So we can see changes and we have to realize that that can also happen, but it's, it's usually um, typically um, pretty well with the electrophysiology findings. Okay. And, and another advantage of ultrasound then, you know, sometimes if you have a focal muscle denervation, you may have a hard time actually finding it with normal EMG and you can use the ultrasound to guide it in, the, in there, so. So they, they usually work together pretty well. Was that kind of the nature of your question? Or you don't know because he's not talking. <laughs> Mike, hello Mike. Okay, maybe he's just out there. Anyway, I have a question for you, Dr. Jeff. Uh, have you encountered any nerve? Uh, because in the upper extremity, we always encounter some kind of a double crush syndrome. Do you see a double crush in the lower leg as well? Um, that's not a term that's we use a lot of at Ohio State. You know, Ernie Johnson's my mentor and he, he basically insisted most things weren't really double crush. Didn't like that term, he didn't like the basis of it. And, and frequently, I'll give you an example and then I'll get back to your question. That, that term's used a lot for carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, which really doesn't make a lot of sense because carpal, the median nerve is motor that's mostly C8, T1, and it's sensory that's mostly C6. And, and so there's not true a double crush in that case. I, you could argue certainly C8 and ulnar, things like that. Um, but back to your question, because it's still a good one. I, just, I am just careful with that term. The classic example that I've, I've seen this more than anything, I think, is the deep branch of the radial nerve in a, in a more proximal radial injury. And, and so it's, it's not a, I don't know if double crush is the right term, but for example, we'll see, we have for years and years thought that nerves healed from a proximal to distal gradient. And, and oftentimes you're left with, you know, the more distal muscles not re -innervating. and And it was always thought that, well, it had too far to go, that the cell body's too far away from, um, you know, that part of the nerve. And then, we, then we've discovered as we've been scanning some of these, for example, somebody with a severe, um, radial nerve injury from, you know, a, a humeral fracture, for example, will heal up to the point that they don't get the digit extensors. And you find that the nerves diffusely enlarged as a result of that nerve injury, that traumatic nerve injury, and it's secondarily entrapped in a place which is a tunnel syndrome. And, and, and so we're seeing, for example, the deep branch of the fibular nerve is, is being secondarily crushed or compressed because of its own abnormal enlargement in a place where it normally wouldn't be affected. And, and I think we I've seen that in other areas too. Even you know um, areas of the tibial nerve. If it's if the nerve is diffusely enlarged, suddenly now at the tarsal tunnel, you may have a, a thing that really needs to be dealt with, whether it's a surgical release or some other kind of hydrodissection release from something more proximally. Same thing with an anterior tarsal tunnel or you know deep fibular nerve injury. The, the nerve itself will be focally enlarged or diffusely enlarged. And, and it may be secondarily entrapped by its, its own enlargement. Okay, Dr. Jeff, I think Pasha's a question. Okay. 
Ash? Hi, good evening, Dr. Jeff. It's always good to see you and listen to you. So my question is, during our lecture on the upper uh, high-frequency uh, scanning of the upper extremity, you, know, you mentioned something about bifid nerves. Have you seen those in the lower extremity? Are there nerves that have you know, those uh, anatomical variants? Yeah, 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 great question. So you know, when we talk about you know, the, the early bifurcation of the median nerve where the proper pomar branch to the third web space, which is what most of those are, branches somewhere in the forearm instead of after the carpal tunnel, that can throw off certainly diagnostic acumen and even therapeutic acumen. The superficial fibular nerve that I showed um, often comes out of the lateral compartment and then bifurcates into the dorsal, the medial and, and intermediate dorsal cutaneous nerves, for example. There's, we just, I saw a patient the other day where that completely bifurcated within the lateral compartment. And, and so there was only sensory deficit in the medial branch and not in the intermediate branch, even though the injury was much further up the leg. And, and so you have to, that, and, and we're trying to figure out why is there no numbness on the intermediate part when the injury was up very high? And it's because there was an early bifurcation just like that. So I, that's the term I like is early bifurcation. There are some anatomic variation. And that's what's great about ultrasound is things that just make no sense, either electrophysiologically or clinically, in terms of localization. You can usually make sense out of it because of that anatomic variation you mentioned. Are you on the moon, Dr. Jim? What? Are you on the moon? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a Burger King, in the Burger King. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Dr. Jeff, for that great lecture today. So thank I know you. you're, you're, it's late in the evening in your, in your place. So I just would like to appreciate you for your time. And, uh, of course, uh, you've, you've always done an amazing uh, lecture every time. So I really appreciate that very much with all these high, ultra-high-frequency images. So um, hoping to see you soon. And uh, yes. just uh, be careful, take care, and uh, always... Uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. So again, uh, on behalf of uh, our group, we would like to thank you so much for all these contributions that you've made for us. Thank you, Dr. Thanks for having me. I feel honored and uh, everybody be safe and hopefully we'll get traveling again and we can see each other in person. So, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jeff. Right. You Take care. You guys have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.